Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Secrets for an Inspirational Life. I hope that you are all well and feeling good today and there's a little bit of sunshine and joy wherever you are in the world and whoever you are with. And it's sometimes difficult for us to remember that actually to be alive is a beautiful thing and to enjoy beautiful things is really a treasure that we have been given secretly sometimes that we don't even realize that we are actually the treasure that we are searching for and all the answers that we want in our life and desire are actually something that we hold deep within us. When we are walking through nature or enjoying the beauty of nature, whether that be the flowers, the fields, the mountains, the rivers and the seas, it's something that brings us back really who we are, back to who we are. And there's a beautiful saying that my next guest uses, and I'm very excited actually about my next guest, I have to say. And he says that we come from Earth and we return to the Earth. And in between, we have gardens. How beautiful. I I simply love that quote. And it's really true, you know. We come from nothing, you know, we enjoy this life as much as we can with whatever brings joy to our soul. And actually, we leave with nothing. So what's important is what we do with our life in between. So it's an absolute pleasure for me to have my next guest today. He is a British horticulturalist, I can never actually say that word, I have to say, who co-hosts the BBC series, The Instant Gardener with Helen Skelton. And he's the ever delightful Danny Clark. Danny was born in Oxford to immigrants from Jamaica. And he founded his own garden design company in 1997 and called himself The Black Gardener. It was actually this name that led him to being noticed and invited to screen test for The Instant Gardener, a daytime BBC programme that started in 2015. He also appeared as a presenter for the BBC on the RHS Chelsea and RHS Tatton Flower Shows and the Tree of the Year for Channel 4. Danny is currently presenting the garden design with the ITV This Morning team. He also appears in lots of other press articles and television and radio productions and programmes. And today he's going to share with us his often magical and delightful journey as a gardener and also as a traveller on this earth. So welcome, Danny. Hello, Mimi. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good, good. And how how is the weather? How is the weather in your part of the world? It's very sunny um, and a little bit of fluffy cloud, but absolutely perfect. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much for joining me today, Danny. It's really a pleasure to have you on the show. You're most welcome. (laughs) <laughs> I'm actually I have to say to um to the listeners I'm really I'm fascinated with gardening but I'm fascinated also with Danny's story because being in the garden is something especially now during lockdown I think that a lot of people have embarked upon but um without further ado I want to ask you Danny tell us a little bit about how you started this whole sort of gardening journey Right. I, I think in, I really got to go back to my childhood, mm-hmm. I suppose. Um, and um, my parents, well, my dad was in the army, mm. so my childhood was very transient. So what I mean by that, I travelled from country to country, um, never staying in one place for maybe longer than a couple of years before having to move on. Mm. In fact, I went to something 
like a dozen different secondary schools. Some schools I'd be at for maybe two or three months, others maybe for a couple of years, depending on how long the posting was yeah. for. Um, and um, I remember, I mean, I was very sporty as a kid, always outside. If I'm not kicking a football around, I was climbing trees. Um, loved my cricket too. And I remember um, carving out a, um, a cricket pitch um, mm -hmm. with a couple of friends so we could play on it. And we just use a pair of old rusty shears, for example, and an old roller we might find from somewhere. So... In my younger years, I had this sort of connection with nature going on. Um, I remember my dad would throw me out to get from under his feet. He would tell me to go into the back garden and um, tidy it up with one of those old push mowers. Um, I didn't really enjoy it at the time, to be honest with you. Mm. But when I had my own um, piece of land, um, when I bought my first property... Mm. Obviously, I had to go into the garden and tidy it up, otherwise it'd be overgrown within a short period of time. Um, and I found when I was doing the garden, I started to enjoy it. And, and I think the reason being is that it evoked memories of my childhood, you know, trying to carve out that cricket pitch, climbing the trees. Um, I remember my dad telling me to go out in the garden and look for a four-leaf clover. Um, yes. I never found. Uh, I yes. think I'm still I'm still looking for it now. <laughs> so am I. I never did find one. I think it was just a way to get us out the house. <laughs> exactly, a way to get rid of us. Yes. Unbeknown to my dad, he was obviously instilling this sort of love for horticulture, mm. and kind of came back, and this love sort of surfaced when I started um, maintaining my own garden. And from maintaining my own garden, um, I, you know what, I, I just remembered something. One of the things that I um, got really um, into was I wanted the perfect lawn. Um, oh, okay. And I, I literally would cut the grass twice a day. So I cut it before I went to work. This was before I was a professional gardener, by the way. Mm. I was in sales at the time. So I'd cut the grass before I went to work and then I'd cut the grass again in the evening because I wanted it to look like, um, I don't know, a football pitch, I guess. You know, mm. the way they can grass shorts. Immaculately. Yeah, immaculate. So, mm. And the secret is to keep cutting it, cut it, cut it, cut it. And that way you can, if you let it grow too long, then cut it, then it's going to look brown. But if you keep trimming it on a regular basis, then it will stay green and short. And that's what I wanted to achieve. Um, but I then realised there's more to life than doing that. So <laughs> um, after a while, um, I kind of um, gave that a miss. You, you, so, you turned a corner with that. I turned a corner. Mm. I turned a corner. Mm. I, I, I just went and found a, a little corner in the shed and sat down and started mumbling to myself. <laughs> and then when I was surface, I thought, well, there are other things in life that are more important than having perfect grass or a perfect yeah. lawn there's a name for that though isn't it when you when when the lawn has to be i can't what is that name you know when people have to have it exactly so the lawn but i can't remember what that's called I, I, i'd call it i'd call it ocd myself oh, yes <laughs> well there is that yes <laughs> and how long did that little episode last it's probably a couple of years, to be fair. Mm, mm. I mean, I, I didn't know my hollyhocks from my weeds at the time, uh -huh. but I just knew that I enjoyed being out in that open space. Yeah. I just loved being in the garden. I'd rather be there than indoors watching TV. It was a form of escapism for me. Yes, there is a sort of a magic to that, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, and, you know, I'd be out there at midnight sometimes, um, forking, aerating the lawn. I don't know if you know, if you're familiar with that. That's basically... No, tell tell us more about that. So what you do, you get a garden fork. It's to assist drainage. Mm -hmm. So you get a garden fork and literally just stab it in the lawn and make holes so that when it rains, the mm. water goes, permeates through, doesn't stay on the surface, and permeates through to the roots of the grass, which um, aids growth, helps aid growth. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
So I'd, I'd go out there late at night, perhaps when it was raining, because mm. it would soften the uh, grass. Yeah. And um, by softening the grass, it just made it easier to put the spikes in the lawn. Mm-hmm. And, um, and does that help, for example, if you've got, I'm interested in this, actually, for my garden. Now, if you've got patches of grass that are not growing, if you did that, would that not work or would that work? It would help. It so would help. It would be one of the things you perhaps would do to rejuvenate that patch. So if that patch was, say, bare or yellow or whatever. Yeah. One one of the things you could do is just to give it a rake. Mm-hmm. So take out what they call the thatch or dead grass mm-hmm. that could be lying on the surface. Take that out, aerate it, so spike it, so that would age drainage. So with any p- participation, rain or whatever that mm-hmm. fall will sort of seep through more easily into the roots. Um, and then I would probably just sprinkle some um, seed in with, say, compost or topsoil, sprinkle it over the surface. And And which sort of seed would you put? Because there's so many different... I've seen so many different types of seed out there. Well, I'll just get a a seed, you know, just go to your local garden Mm centre and just find something there. Uh, Just read the packet. You can get hard-wearing seed or you can get um, seed that's more hard-wearing, no, hard-wearing seed or seed that's not so hard-wearing, which is probably finer stuff, will give you finer grass. It will look lovely, but Mm. not you you won't better walk on it all the time. So you you have to make that choice Mm -hmm. as to which one you would choose. Um, whether you want something more delicate that's great to look at or something that you can be walking on all the time or something that the kids are going to be rolling around on. Okay, okay. So there's Uh, different types. uh, Yeah, and then then all you need to do is just do that and then just just make sure it's moist. And um, within 10 days or so, it should germinate and um, that part of the lawn should start to repair itself. I'm going to try that. I know you, this is funny, but um, we have a cat and um, it's an indoor cat and they say that you have to give it grass to eat. So I've been growing grass in pots, Danny, and yeah. it's grown within four days. Exactly, yeah. You I will was... do. If the conditions are right, I think mm. it needs to be about 10 degrees centigrade water and it will germinate very quickly. Yes, I was impressed. And I thought I, I knew you were coming on. I thought I have to ask you about this because that was just so impressive how quickly that it didn't grow outside, funnily enough, though. So I put it in the log cabin and it just grew, literally. Yeah. It seemed overnight. Yeah, that's that's probably because the conditions were better for it in the log cabin than outside. When did you do it? Uh, last week. Oh, last week. Well, yeah. it should have been enough to germinate outside so i'm not sure why that would happen normally the only reason that it probably wouldn't germinate two reasons Mm. would be temperature and lack of water ah okay all right outside maybe because we've had very dry weather recently Yes, and I just I put it on the outside of the veranda and nothing was happening and I was ever so disappointed and I thought, oh, no. And then I had this brainwave and I thought, maybe it will grow if it's in a darker place. Yeah. You know, like the mushroom effect. I don't know why I thought of that. So I put that in and literally overnight, you know, it was like about a centimetre it had grown. Wow. So that impressed me and I thought I have to ask you about the grass because I've tried putting grass before, but it's not taken. Right. Well, another another trick, see, when you grew that in your log cabin, Mm. the grass, that is quite good because you you obviously put it in some compost. Well, it was like... um... A gravelly type of thing, not not stones, but it sort of looked yeah. like I bought it and it said it was a good thing to use and then to plant these seeds in. Um, yes. But it was a mishmash. It looked like a mishmash of stuff. Grit. I would say you got grit and soil, perhaps. Yeah, that, that's what it looked like, yes. 
okay, so what I would then do, now you started off in the log cabin, mm. I would then spread that on that area of grass. You started it off now. I would spread it on the damaged oh, part. Okay. And it will take. Because you've done the hard bit. Yes, yes. I'm going to do that. Thank you very much for that, actually. <laughs> I was even, I was in the petrol station and... Um, I'm always fascinated talking about gardening and I was in the petrol station and the guy there that I know was saying to me, how is your garden? You know, you need to get these seeds and these seeds. And I thought, I'm not sure he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> but I tried and it didn't work and I sort of gave up. <laughs> and I'm going, come, I'm, coming to, I'm coming to Danny because he's the expert. So just forget everybody else. <laughs> now, Danny... How how long have you been? Because you're also a garden designer, aren't you? You're on this morning. You're on the BBC show as well, Instant Gardener. How did your career literally flourish for you to now be a well-known gardener? How did all that happen? Because I know when we spoke before, you were telling me that your love of gardening also was because of a lady in a yes. house. And that yes. was quite fascinating. Please share that with us. Okay, so we can fast forward really mm. from um, from me having my own um, piece of land and um, getting hooked on horticulture, let's say. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm now in sales, um, and it's doing quite well. I've got a business partner, and then um, after a few years, the business has started to struggle. It was in the early nineties when. We had the negative equity situation mm -hmm. where um, our houses weren't worth, we didn't have much equity in our property. So basically, the, um, they weren't, our properties weren't worth very much, I suppose. The negative the equity sort of kicked yeah, in. The negative yeah. Equity, yeah. So no one was really buying my equipment. Um, so we were struggling a bit. And out of the blue, I got this phone call from a lady who was looking for a gardener. Um, I'd been recommended by a friend of mine who knew that I was interested in gardening. Mm. And this lady needed help because her garden was proven to be a bit of a struggle for her because she had health issues. Mm. Um, anyway, I went around to see this lady, Jo Bryan, and she was the most amazing lady you could ever wish to meet. She um, had a larger-than-life character, and um, she what she didn't know about gardening put on the back of a postage stamp. She was very, very knowledgeable, and um, I worked for her for about three years until her death. But while I worked for her, people would approach me and ask if I would come and do their gardens. And um, I oh, got to a point okay. where, although I was still in sales at the time mm. and doing... Joe's garden one day a week, I got to a point where I had to make a decision. Do I go into horticulture full-time or do I want to carry on with the sales? For me, it was a no-brainer mm. because I love gardening and that's the direction I took. Now, Joe, I mean, I must mention, talk about Joe for a while. She um, taught me to look at things in a different way. I remember so, you telling me that you must share this. This is such a fascinating and interesting yeah, yeah. story. So she, she, I would arrive at her house. I mean, she was one of these people that had an all year round tan. Uh, she had the most amazing garden. She's always in it. Mm. Um, that's why she had the t all year round tan. Mm. I mean, the house was falling down, but the garden was immaculate. <laughs> and when I'd arrive, she'd, uh, it'd be pouring down the rain, windy, cold, and all the rest of it. And she could tell by the look on my face that all I wanted her to say was, Danny, don't worry about gardening today. Come round tomorrow when it's come back tomorrow when it's a bit warmer, mm. and um, but she wouldn't do that. She would say, "Danny, Danny, what a lovely dramatic day, isn't it fantastic?" And really, what she was saying was, although it's windy and it's cold and um, it's raining, there's a beauty in everything. And it's all a state of mind. It, the sky doesn't have to be blue for it to be beautiful. It can be grey, it can be rainy, it can be windy, and it can still be gorgeous. Oh. And, and that would just alter my mindset. And I think, do you know what? She's right. And we would just get on. 
and uh, go and enjoy the space. How wonderful is that? Because, you know, a lot of us sometimes, you know, we wait for the sunny days to live. You know, oh, when it's summer, we're going to do this, you know, and we'll have a good time and it will be happy when it's summer. But this is what's so wonderful is that every day is an adventure, mm. isn't it? It doesn't have to be sunny and um, mm. blue skies for it to be a beautiful day. Mm. It can be snowing and be beautiful, be windy and be beautiful. Yes. It could be hailstone and be, be beautiful. Yes. Yeah. You know, every you know, the amount of people that say to me, Oh, what a horrible day it is today because they're shivering and yes. it's cold. Yeah. No, no, it's not a horrible day. It's it's a beautiful day. But it's just beautiful in a different way. I'm absolutely with you on that um outlook on life, Danny, because I think that every day has its beauty. It doesn't matter, really, what the weather is like. If we're always just waiting for the sunny days, I think will be hugely disappointed in life. Especially in this country. Yes, <laughs> definitely, definitely. So, Danny, tell us a little bit um, about how Joe taught you to see the beauty in all of these things. Because I remember when we were talking before, you said to me that she would call you over and absolutely be delighted in the smallest of things to show you. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, I'd be in the garden. I mean, she had a fast plot, I must admit. So um, it was a couple of acres of um, garden and woodland. And I'd be over one side of the garden, you know, doing whatever, planting bulbs, let's say. And she'd be trimming a hedge on the other side of the garden. And um, I'd be in my own little world and then I'd hear her calling, Danny, Danny, come and look at this. Mm. And um, I'd put down my tools and go jogging over to her and um, thinking that she was going to show me something really exciting, which she did, in fact. But, you know, at the time, I probably wasn't appreciating it as much as I should have done. Mm. But it kind of changed my the way I look at the world. Um, and she'd say, look at this, Danny, just look at this spider's web. Look how wonderful it is. Look at the shape. Look at its. Look at the way the dew's glistening on it. Look at that spider. Look at it all curled up there, looking all restful. And um, it was, you know, what she was doing was saying all these things tend to get ignored by people, mm. you know, in our everyday lives. But she was saying you need to slow down and take things in and look at the world because it's so beautiful. She would, for example, call me over just to show me the minutest of flowers. And she'd say, look at the colour of it. Look at the, isn't that yellow so vivid? Isn't the orange stamen so fantastic? I mean, how did nature manage to make something so fantastic? So she was full of wonderment for the world. And the tiny things, the little things that we probably not see or not notice she would bring to my attention um so again she was saying there's a beauty in everything if you choose to look for it but you just need to slow down and use your eyes mm. and take time mm. to stop and appreciate it and that's sort of the secret isn't it danny is to take that time to <clears throat> see the beauty in all of these things. And do you think that she taught you and inspired you to then um, go from there to further your career as a gardener? Absolutely, because it was her enthusiasm. I mean, you know, they do say, you know, it's, it's enthusiasm is contagious. Yes. Passion is contagious. So I took that passion on board with me um, because, you know, she was showing me a different way. And I would think to myself, you know, she's absolutely right. And, you know, I, I kind of, I mean, I did have that in me anyway, but I think she was bringing it out in a clever way, you know, without browbeating me. She was just saying, look, look at this, look at that. Look how wonderful it is. Look how beautiful it is. And all that stuff that was inside me from my childhood, let's say, mm. was then brought to the surface and I kind of recognised it and I just went on from there, really. 
And then how did you get into your TV presenting? How did that um, happen? Uh, right. So I, would, I had always had a thing for design. Okay. So I was maintaining gardens for a few years. So with Joe, that was maintenance, and then her friends would approach me, so I'd go maintain their garden. So that side of the business built up. But I'd always had a passion for um, gar- for design mm-hmm. and garden design in particular. And um, I decided to enrol at Horticultural College, Hadlow, down near Tunbridge in Kent. Mm-hmm. And I did a year's course. And that then gave me the confidence to then start designing gardens. So I designed as well as maintained. And, you know, when it comes to technology, I break out in a cold sweat. Join the club. And people, for, yeah, <laughs> and people for years have been saying to me, do you know what you need to do? You need to get have an online presence. Um, and um, because people, when they want a gardener, they don't um, find a phone book. They go on, like they type, they do a, an internet search and type in garden designers and hopefully your um, business will pop up. Mm. So basically they'll say you need a website, etc., etc. Mm. I did have a website going under the name of Barrington, sorry, Susie Barrington Garden Design or Barrington Susie Garden Design. I got the name the wrong way around. Mm-hmm. Barrington Susie Garden Design, but it wasn't really working for me. I didn't get any calls from it. Um, and I had this idea, do you know what? Because people are talking about unique selling points. Oh, yes. Um, so it's all about the name, what's going to bring somebody to your site. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that I was aware of was the name, having a name that's memorable. And I thought to myself, and I was inspired by a guy who calls himself the Black Farmer. Um, and the reason he calls himself the black farmer is that he's the only black farmer in the country. I and think I've seen that. Is does he run? Literally, he sells to all different supermarkets. It does, and it's gluten free products. Yes, I've seen so that. So he does gluten free bacon, sausages, etc. And he's carved out a really. I mean, his products are in Waitrose, Sainsbury's, and all those yes. places. And mm. he's carved out a really um, lucrative business for himself. Mm. Mm. And the name just sort of sticks out, the Black Farmer. Yes. Um, It says what it does, it does what it says on a tin. Mm. And I thought to myself, well, if he calls himself the Black Farmer and there is rare as a hen's teeth, so uh, personal gardeners, there is rare as a hen's teeth, why don't I call myself the Black Gardener? Mm. And that's when my life changed. I I remember going to a, um, one of these uh, marketing, um, sort of meetings set up by local council Mm -hmm. Um, and what they do basically they just look on your online presence and suggest ways that you can improve it Mm. and um, the guy was sort of when it it was my turn you know he went round everybody that was there and spoke to them then it was my turn and at the time the name was still Barrington Susie Garn Design and he said to me um, what's memorable about the name? And I said, well, nothing really, um, I guess. But I said, I thought about changing my name to the Black Gardener. And he looked at me and he nearly fell over. <laughs> he said, that's fantastic. He said, that is just genius. Well, I said, it's not really because I copied it. But I just <laughs> changed it around a bit and I explained the story. Mm. And he said, that is, he said, you get nothing out of today. You must change the name from Brandon Seuss Garden site. Mm. to the black girl and he said it's memorable there's a serious message behind it if you want to find it and it's also tongue in cheek Mm. no one is going to forget that you won't even have to give business cards out yes yes because people can remember it and that's what I did I changed the name to the black gardener and um, that's when things started to change for me and then um, it must have only been about three or four months later Mm. I got this random email from 12 Yard, a production company. Mm. And I thought it was a wind-up. I thought, because basically he said, we're looking for new talent. Would you be interested in doing a screen test for a new garden series that we have commissioned? And I thought, no, I nearly deleted it. 
because I thought it was somebody trying to scam me for some money or whatever. So mm. my sister, Jenny, who's an agent, looked into it for me. Uh-huh. And she called me 20 minutes later and said, no, it's genuine. Um, 12 Yard are looking for a black gardener to present this show. Um, and they wanted a black gardener to do the presenting because they wanted to fresh up the industry because you've got your Alan Tish Marshes and your Monty Dons. And mm-hmm. It's very kind of perceived as being white and middle class. Uh-huh. So they wanted to do something different and fresh. Yeah. And um, the, someone in um, development apparently was thinking, well, how do I find a black gardener? Because there's rare sensitivity. I mean, where do I find one? Mm. So um, she thought, I know what I'll do. I'll Google black gardeners. And my website came up. And that's how it happened. And um, within two or three days, Mm. I had a film crew at my place film me doing the test. Um, They said they were looking at other people. I don't know if they were. I think they just said that, to be honest. (laughs) I think they just said that. (laughs) They were playing it cool. They were playing it very cool. Yes, Um, yes. (laughs) And they said they'd let me know. Um, Three days later, they... um, called me to say the BBC liked me would I like to do a pilot mm. so I said yeah that'd be great three days later phone me said forget the pilot let's go straight to series because we're that confident it's going to work and within about three months three or four months it was all filmed and on on BBC one daytime and how did you feel that Lady Luck had sort of, you know, smiled at you, Danny? Well, it was weird, really, because it was like somebody was... Because I've had a, a bit of bad luck in leading up to that, in that I lost uh, three of my siblings and um, mm. my father in a space of six years. So it kind of felt that they, along with Joe Bryan, who gave me my first gardening job, mm. were up there. Um, moving the pieces and having a bit of a laugh. Um, looking down on you. Looking down on me. And mm. yeah, and, and, and you know, it's a nice thought. Whether it's true or not, it doesn't really matter. But it was just a thought of mine. It, it kind of made me smile because there were so many things that happened during that period of time mm-hmm. that I would think to myself, is this coincidence or is it a bit more than that? It was, um, it was really weird. I mean, I remember um, right about the time that I changed the name to the Black Gardener, mm. I was I fell twenty feet out of a tree on my head, oh my and God. I survived that fall without breaking anything. And the chances of that happening apparently are very remote. If you fall six feet on your head, is normally fatal. But I fell sixty twenty feet on my head, and I, I'm here to tell the tale. That's so a miracle. That kind of, it was a miracle. Yeah, you could do that a hundred times. At ninety nine point nine percent of the time, you would um, either be seriously injured or dead. Mm, mm. So that that happened, and you know, and then the rest I've just mentioned. So it was um, it was all a bit bizarre, really. It was almost like the wheel of fortune that come back into my sphere. Yes, by just. What we think is just by changing a name. But they say that, don't they? That names have certain energies behind them. I know a lot of, you know, like a lot of famous people or actors or singers who never made it with their name. And then suddenly by changing the name, it brought a whole different energy and luck into their life. Yes. Yes, it it, it could be that. It could be also your frame of mind. Because you've changed the name, it might perk you up and make you see the world in a different way and you exude positivity. Yes. And then other people feed off of that. I think in life you do make your own luck to an extent. I mean, I remember talking to people about changing the name to the Black Gardener and I tell you, a lot of people kind of objected to it. Why? But, well, I think they thought it was, I mean, oh, you can't call yourself that. Isn't that being racist? Well, that's that was what you one are. angle. Exactly, exactly. I mean, these these concerns were quite illogical, but there was a bit of negativity going on. 
mm. at the time. Mm. You know, mm. she, and um, other people say, "Now you got to do it. That's great." But there were people who were saying, "No, hang on a minute. I'm not sure. You know, the time is right for that kind of thing." Um, but having said that, I did go for it, and it was the best thing I could have done. If I ever had a moment of genius, yes. it was then. That my only single moment of genius in my life <laughs> was when I changed the name. <laughs> was that? Would you say that was a transformational point in your life, Danny? Yes, it was because I remember even kind of at the time. I here's, here's an example. Around about that time, I mean, for years and years, I used to shave my hair. Mm -hmm. And um, what completely? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'd be look bald. Mm -hmm. So I literally had what you might call um, a dome, a shiny dome <laughs> for a head. Okay. And, um, and why did you just, do that? Why? Mm. Why did I shave my head? I, I, I just did. Like a fashion. Fashion. Fashion, fashion mm -hmm. um, you know, less maintenance, um, whatever. I just did it. It made me feel cleaner, mm -hmm. uh, what, you know. And... Um, I um around about that time I just got decided to grow my hair. It it kinda wasn't a conscious thing, it just happened. Mm, mm. I just couldn't be bothered shaving it anymore. I've seen uh, your hair, I think it's quite magnific magnificent actually. Oh thank you. Yes. Thank you. I have to encourage the listeners, you know, they'll they'll see anyway your photograph, but it is, it's sort of very main like now. Yes, it's very long now. Mm. <laughs> it's gone through a few stages to get to this. <laughs> and the next stage, when I was letting it grow, uh -huh. was um, I had a little afro going on. But um, although I was washing it, I wasn't um, really maintaining it. I wasn't combing it. Um, and then it started to dread. It started to mat. Mm. I thought, oh, this is a bit of all right, and um, <laughs> I just, I just went with it, and now I've got these dreads. So five or six years later, my hair is halfway down my back, and it's grown so very quickly, of, though, hasn't it? It has grown very quickly. Yes, yes. Is there a secret so to that? Was, that? Sorry, is there a secret to growing your hair very long? Oh, I don't know. I've never really given it any thought. To be fair. Um, I think it helps if you have a good diet and um, mm. you've got a healthy lifestyle. That must contribute to it, mm. I would imagine, which I do have. Um, but yeah, it was um, it, it was all part. It's all must like oh, for that time. I kind of metamorphosized into another being. Is that what um, it felt I, like? It kind of felt like that over a period of time. I was kind mm. of changing into, well, I was still the same person, but I was just changing as a person into um, a very a different variation of myself is probably a better way to put it. Um, and I became kind of um, more, um, not, not, I couldn't keep, give, a bit more relaxed about myself, a bit more relaxed. And um, sort of realise what is more important in life than getting up in the morning and shaving your head. And, um, you know, I just let myself go a little bit. Just allow myself to be me. Yes. It's, and be natural. And, and be, be natural. natural. And Yeah, be natural. <laughs> what he dreads to me signifies is, is that, exactly that. Because, you know, thousands of years ago, we all had dreads before we started um, preening ourselves. Mm, mm. Um, that's the way we were. And if you like, I was instinctively going back to that period of time. I mean, a lot of people assume that it's some sort of religious thing that I'm sort of um, doing, but, but I'm not. It's all For me, it's all about being yourself and being natural. It's nothing to do with any religion. Um, or anything like that. I suppose it's like when people change, you know, I've had this conversation so many times before, mm. people think that when you change, they said, oh, you have to change, you have to change. And I'm actually, I'm. it's not about that. I think it's not changing uh, to be something different. I think it's mm. changing to be really who you are, isn't it? 
Yes, I suppose it is, really. And, mm. and it's stripping away all that rubbish that we've accumulated over the years, mm. Mm. Um, all that pretense and stuff, and delving down deep into your soul and rediscovering who you really are, perhaps how you were meant to be. But through conditioning over the years, you sort of become something else. Um, and we just need to get back and strip all that rubbish down and sort of get back to the chassis, if you like, and maybe rebuild ourselves in a truer way. That's a rather beautiful way to look at things, actually. Uh, you know, and I think it's absolute truth. It's getting back, really to who we truly are, getting back to the essence and to the core of who we are and yeah. actually celebrating that. Yes, yeah, for sure, for sure. I think so. We, we, we need to, and I think we all need to, and I think many people do that, um, as a, and they would call it a life change mm. when they reach a certain age. So they'll think they may be working in the city. I mean, I knew this guy who's working in the city, mm. um, earning lots of money and all the rest of it, and he gave it all up to be a tree surgeon. I don't blame because, him. Sorry? I don't blame him. Yeah, gave it up to be a tree because he wasn't enjoying life. He said if he carried on like that, he would have killed him. He said he had all the, um, you know, the big house, the big car and stuff, but it, he realised that that was of no importance. He needed to be himself, and um, he's now a tree surgeon doing very well for himself. So he's gone back to nature. He's gone back to gone, his real self. Yeah. In yes, essence. he's gone back to nature. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm. And I think that's what a lot of people do. They they come to horticulture as a way of love, a life change. I know, you know, I, I can think of at least a dozen people that I know who've done that. Who've, so who've done that, has, gone back to the natural way of living. Got gone back to the natural way, as, as near as they can, as mm. near as they can. Yeah. You can't do it 100%, mm. but a good start maybe for them is to get into either tree surgery or horticulture or run a nursery, something like that. Something that has a strong link to nature. And it's true, really, because I, I like the quote of yours of... Um, that we come from the earth and we go back to the yeah. earth and in between are the gardens. And yeah. I, 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 there's there's a lot of wisdom in that, isn't there? Yeah, I think so. Because, I mean, I, I think, I mean, it's just my personal view, I think mm. we all come from the soil. Yeah. We originate from the same speck of dust. We are all um, linked to each other. We're all brothers and sisters, let's yeah. say. Yeah. Um, and um, through evolution, we've just evolved in different ways. So apparently, we all came from one place in Africa. Some went north, some stayed where they were, mm. and they it, were dark black. Some migrated north, so they they changed for the environment. They became lighter skinned. Their noses became more pointy, um, it, just to cope with the conditions. Some went east and they changed, some went west and they changed. So that accounts for the different races, but we all were the same right at the beginning. I mean, for example, you don't see black polar bears, do you? No. You don't, you don't see, you know, you don't see black polar bears, period, but you'll see brown bears where it's warmer mm. um, you'll see white foxes where it's very cold but you see brown foxes where it's where the um, conditions are more temperate mm. so it, for me it's common sense to suggest that we are who we are because of our environment where we're living and we're constantly changing as human beings constantly changing as our environment changes um because we need to do that to survive yes it's like for example i read many many years ago a book called i don't know whether you read it called the little prince 
No, I haven't read it. Okay, and he it's it's a it's a story by Anton Saint Exupéry, and it's um, look it can be read by children or by adults, and it was written many years ago. I don't know, maybe fifty years ago, maybe even more. And he talks about a rose who because he falls in love with a rose, and. Um, he said that no matter how, because the rose has suffered. So it's an analogy about life. And he said, it doesn't matter where you place that rose. It's still a rose. It's just sort of the environment that um, creates its upsets and its sorrows or its joys, you know, but fundamentally, it's still what it is. And I think as humans... We are still who we are. We're still human. It doesn't matter where we come from. Fundamentally, we are from the same speck of dust, like you say. We are. We are all from the same speck of dust. And, mm. you know, what I was saying as well, the enjoyment is the gardens in between, because that's what I love. Oh. And then we go back to the earth later. Mm. So, mm. And, and for me, um, one of the uh, aspects of gardening that I think I find so soulful mm. is, um, and I think this is why people tend to come to horticulture late in, later in life, um, either professionally or, you know, just by way of enjoyment, is because we do have that link to the earth and we know we're going back there subconsciously. And it's almost a way of preparing ourselves for um, for our eternity. What a beautiful line. Preparing for eternity. Mm, that is yeah. so beautiful. What a beautiful line that is. And I think that is the possibly the whole the wholeness of everything is that everything we do, if we do it with this love and this passion, you know, like your friend, the lady that sort of introduced you to gardening, I think we can actually capture that glimpse of eternity, can't we? Yeah, we can. Yeah, definitely. And then, we, we and then you know, that bit of soil that we, you know, we, we end up in a soil again, mm. and that will continue again in another form. Whatever form that is, who knows? Mm. Mm. But that will continue in another form. And you can see it in plants, can't you? You know the the birth and rebirth thing that's going on. So the plant it will it will um, it will come from a seed, so the seed, and then the plant will grow, and then it will die, and then go back into the soil, and then it will regenerate again, perhaps in another form, perhaps in the same form. Who knows? Yes, who knows? Now this sort of, in a way, you regenerated, didn't you, back into your real form? Would you say? Yes, I think I, I've regenerated, or, or I wouldn't say maybe it's regenerate the mm. right word. Maybe adjusted. Adjusted, yes. Maybe I've adjusted. I've adjusted into um, the person I feel I should be, r rather than carried on what was in effect something that wasn't true. It wasn't so, real. What well, wasn't real, yeah. So, mm. so this is more real. So I'm doing something that. See, for me, it's not work. Mm. It's it's what I do. It's a way of life. What I did before was work. So I worked to live, whereas I live to work now, and that's the subtle difference that um, I've um, I've created, shall we say. That's a huge shift, isn't it, in in a life to be able to do that? It takes, I think it takes an element of bravery. Oh, absolutely. You know, to say, yeah. you know, this is, I'm going to leave that behind. Mm. I want to go on a different path now. Because mm. um, many people don't do that. Um, they carry on because for security, for security. Mm. Because the um, alternative to them is unimaginable. But I think life really has got to be a quest for happiness. Um, well, for me it is anyway. Mm. And I would say that I'm a much more happy, relaxed um, being 
than I was before I entered on this new path. Yes, a quest for happiness. I mean, it's, I don't know, what do you think about this, Danny? I always liken it to that I don't feel that happiness is a destination. I feel that it's absolutely daily living, momentary uh, glimpses, momentary experiences that actually pave that road called happiness. Yes, I mean, it's like, you know, Joe saying to me, come and look at this yes. um, little yellow flower. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, you, but but sometimes it needs someone to bring that happiness out in you. you mm. I think sometimes you don't even realise you're happy. But, yeah. but something yeah. needs to happen that thinks, makes you realise how you're feeling. Yes, uh, yeah, like a light be, shining on it. Yeah, it could be like sometimes I'll walk into a garden and I just, it will make me feel a certain way. But I think that the way I I was feeling like that anyway, but it's just made me feel more conscious of the way, you know, of the way I'm feeling. Are you more aware? Is Is it an energetic thing where you're more, do you think, connected to the garden and thus you are then more connected to yourself? Um, I don't know if it's really connected. It, can, it probably is a connection, you know, mm. I'll walk into a space. I remember on Instant Garden, I think it was down in Wales, mm. and I walked into this garden for the first time um, because the opening sequence where I'm looking at the garden, I genuinely am walking into, as they're filming me, Mm. that is the first time I'm actually walking into that outside space. So it's really done in one take. And I remember saying, it was a wall garden um, Mm. near the, I can't remember which coast it was nearby, but it wasn't far from a a beach. And I remember walking into that space and feeling this warmth. It was almost like this garden was wrapping itself around me. Wow. And um, I and I told the viewer that I said, "Oh, this gone," and I, I felt a shudder, but a nice shudder. Do you know a nice mm. feeling? Mm. And I mm. actually felt that as I walked into that back into the yard, and I said to the viewer, "Oh, God, this this does make me feel good." Wow! <laughs> and I did actually feel that it was true. Mm. It wasn't made up. Um, and um, I think um, spaces can make you feel like that. It's a bit like when you walk into someone's home. You know, you know, sometimes, yeah. I don't know if it's ever you've ever experienced, like when you're buying a property mm-hmm. or you may even be renting a property. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you decided you want that property before you've actually got in the front door. Yeah. Because you have that feeling. It's, it's the same kind of thing, I think. It's like an intuition. or It's an intuition, sense. it's an instinct or mm. whatever mm. it is. Mm. Um, I remember one of the properties that I bought with my then partner many, many years ago. Mm. We decided on a property as soon as we turned into the road. We hadn't seen it. In fact, the property was falling to bits. We, had, we spent a couple of years renovating it. But that didn't matter. It, it was just the, the feel of it, the feel of the area that made us uh, want to live there. Something felt right within you. Something me. felt right, mm. yeah. Something felt really right about it. And is that, do you think, Danny, I'm curious, with regards to when you're designing your gardens, is it that you sort of click into... I don't know, call it a vibe, call it a feeling, that you know how you're going to make that garden look? Well, to be fair, when it comes to garden design, mm. um, that you have what you call a client brief. So you speak to the client and, you know, a good designer, I think, mm. will listen to the client and more or less give them what they want. But mm. you will put a twist on it to make it more aesthetically pleasing. Mm, mm. Um, Otherwise, if they just leave it up to you, you might design something that they're not happy with. So really, by listening to the client, you just take aspects of what they're saying and interpret it in such a way that they find it, um, that they interpret such a way that they like and they want. 
with your added sort of magical yeah. sort so, of fairy so dust. They might, mm. Yeah, so they might say, look, I want a patio mm. and I want it to um, look like this and look like that. But then you could say, well, yeah, that's great, but how about, what do you think if we did this? And just throw some ideas at them. So you, you're not... You're, 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 what, what you're not doing, you're not forcing your own beliefs onto them. You right. kind of make them feel that they've got, um, they're part of the process. Because at the end of the day, that space has got to represent them, their personality, and not the designers. And we were talking about this earlier, weren't we, about, yeah. you know, I know I was sort of joking about it, that you could be the garden therapist, but I do think there's a lot in that, is that <clears throat> it is a form of therapy, isn't it? People's gardens are sort of really a part of them. It is a part of them. Like your inside, your home is a part of you, mm. isn't it? I mm. mean, you know, you'll do... You, you, your interior of your property, your house, the way you place things, the things you buy represent your personality. Mm. And it's the same with the garden. It's, it's the inside out thing or the outside in thing. The two should link up and say who you are as a person. Mm. If you can say who you are as a person in your space, it makes you feel more comfortable about the area that you're living in. It's like your stamp, isn't it? Your personality stamp. Absolutely. And every mm. bond has a different personality. Yes. Um, and that should be represented, that should be shown in how you live. Yes, even if that is a small space, yeah. um, the smallest of spaces or the largest of spaces, it's, it's, yeah. you've got to be able to feel free. Yeah, and, and feel comfortable. Mm. So it's a, it's a place that you feel free, feel comfortable, um, and it's a place where you express yourself. So you express yourself with the furniture you buy, the paintings you put on the wall, the colour of the wall, that kind of thing. It's the same in the garden. Mm. You express yourself with the colour of the fence, the, um, the the objects you put in that in, in that space. Um, what, what, what flowers you might use. That's all a part of who you are. And I think if you can do that in your space, either interior or exterior, I think it makes for a more contented person because you've then got your little oasis that you can come to um, after wherever you've been during that, that day. Yeah. That um, you can close that door mm. and you're in your world and it wraps itself around you and protects you. Yes, it's the sanctuary, you know, that w yeah. absolutely. And we all need that, especially in <clears throat> these times. Um, yeah. it, it's, they're not easy times, for sure. And to come back and to look at something beautiful that represents, as you say, something inner that shines from yourself... <clears throat> Uh, it's a mirror, really, isn't it, of our inner it being? Is. It is, absolutely, absolutely. Mm. And it's it's comforting, isn't it? Mm. You mm. know, I know when I come back to my place, and that's, you know, I, I just feel comfortable. Yeah, you you, you just it's feel like, safe. Ah, oh, I can relax now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I can, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a place where I can come, it's, it's an escape, and, and, be, and be yourself. Yes, yes, to be yourself. And that's such an important thing. And and yet it's so difficult, isn't it, sometimes, Danny? Because I know that, you know, I want to go back to what you said about you are now sort of, you've adjusted to being who you really are. Now, how did you get to that point? What were the certain things that happened in life? Was it one particular thing that made you actually now be comfortable and happy in the presence of yourself in I, I just think it was gardening i already did get my hands mm. in the soil and being close to nature mm. um and feeling the wind and um you know um the sun the warmth of the sun um the birds tweeting um seeing seeing a snail you know um 
sort of get going along a branch, um, looking at seeing, looking at all the vivid colours of plants, or not so vivid colours. Mm. It was that kind of thing, really. That it just gave me a connection to to life, I suppose. And um, you know, when when I'm in those spaces, mm-hmm. it just frees my mind. I'm never happier than when I'm in a garden. I'm never I, happier. Yeah, I'm because just I'm, I, yeah, yeah. Or if I'm not in a garden, even if I'm just walking through woodland, mm, mm. it or, or, or parkland, um, walking along a river, alongside a river. It just so happens that I'm in a profession where I have all those things. I mean, how, people, how lucky and wonderful is that? Yeah, yeah. I, I feel very privileged to be in that situation. But if you're not, it doesn't matter because mm. you can still go for those long walks and go and visit those gardens. You know, the ones that are open to the public, the famous ones, yeah. like Sissinghurst Gardens or Great Dixter or Wisley. You mm. can still do it. You can still get your therapy. Mm. Um, but I think that is an important thing for all of us as humans to do because that's our way of getting back to nature and that's that's our connection that's how we we came to be who we are i I totally agree with you uh. Danny I totally agree with you and it's there is something about it and it in a you know when you were talking about the wind and the rain and you know, it's actually listening to the voice of all of these elements that are intrinsically yeah. part of us, that remind us, in a way, of who we are. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, mm. Absolutely. Beautiful. It, it, it's, it's stunning. And I, I love your work and I love what you do. And the fact that you have this wider sense and, in a way, you know, it's a sixth sense for beauty because we all have it but sometimes we don't we don't cultivate it do we no no we don't cultivate it and i I think because a lot of us aren't really aware of it because we're so busy charging around Mm. you know getting on with our lives um you know work and um you might have children that you've got to sort of take to school and pick them up and Mm. got to cook them dinner and before you know it you're you're tired out, you're in bed, and then you're on this treadmill because you've got to do the same thing the following day. Mm. Mm. And this is what um, lockdown, I think, one of, if anything's good has come out of it, is that it's made us slow down and look at the world in a different way. And the whole world, isn't it? We were, mm. and we are still in it all together, is... Yeah. Um, that's one of the miraculous things, I think, that came out of it. And as you say, one of the good things is that suddenly we were forced, we were forced literally to go mm. back to ourselves. Yes, we were. We were. And one of the ways we did that was through our gardens. Mm. So mm. many people were out in their gardens. Um, I think there was a survey done that 60. 60- 64% of people, what was it? 64% of people planted more this year than they did in corresponding time last year. Yeah, I believe that because I was trying yeah. to get some things and everything was sold out, sold out, sold, sold out. Exactly. And, yeah. um, but that's understandable. It comes back to your um, point of that we know that we belong to the earth. We know that. Yeah. And yeah. in times of disaster, like now, in a way, it's like a war, isn't it? Um, yeah. We know what matters. We know what's going to fundamentally make us feel better about ourselves. Yeah, we do know what's going to make us feel better about ourselves. I mean, I think people have been itching to get out to their gardens. Mm. But obviously, we were forced to do it through lockdown. Yeah. Um, and, and the other statistic I heard, which I find very sort of sad in a way, mm. and we need, and hopefully, you know, we can encourage people to keep um, gardening, is that 30%, I think it's 36% of people said that they um, would um, not be looking after their gardens because they're after lockdown because their lives were going to be too busy. Oh. So. So, so, so there's going to be a percentage of people 
who um, will um, give will give up on their on their good habits that have been formed. That's sad, isn't it? I think that's very sad, but mm. I hope that's not the case. Um, and they will carry on enjoying their outside spaces because it's just good for the mind, the soul, and the body. Yeah. Um, and, and it's also good for wildlife because if we're planting stuff in our gardens, mm. it's not only just us that benefit, but the um, the the the, the, um, the animals as well. You know, the birds, the bees, the butterflies. I've seen so many bees now, and um, Danny, and so many butterflies, more than I have seen in the past few years. And I was talking to another guest the other day, and um, he's a beekeeper. Well, actually, he's a bee whisperer. Yeah. um, Which is interesting. And he was talking about this whole thing of he creates these um, beehives and um, his name's Nick Muscle and he creates beehives and and buildings that are wooden in woodlands and Uh he's all about like yourself about getting back to nature and encouraging all these bees to be able to pollinate and creating Uh the the right environment for that yeah which is so Uh, necessary uh, isn't it it is very necessary, and, mm. and, and it's a win-win situation because he's benefiting because he's doing something, you know, he's connecting with nature, mm. and the, the wildlife's benefiting yeah, because they're, they're, they're getting something out of it from what he's doing. It's, it, we're you're in unison, aren't we? You're in unison, yeah, so we're connecting with them, and they're connecting with us. Mm. And, and we've gone away from that over the last few years. And hopefully the one positive that's coming out of what's happened in the last few months is that we are all going to reconnect. I believe that, for sure. Mm. And I think we've already well. started, haven't we? Yeah, we have already started, yes. Definitely. I kind of feel like things have come a full circle uh, for me because uh-huh. I met Alan Tishmarsh at Chelsea in 2016. Mm-hmm. And I told him the story of how I was inspired to be a garden designer. And um, I um, lived in a bedsit mm. back in the mid-90s after um, I split from my first um, partner. Mm. And um, I used to watch a program called Ground Force. I don't know if you know that. I remember that, yes. Yeah. So um, basically that was Alan Titchmarsh, Charlie Dimmock and Tommy Walsh. And they would transform people's gardens. Mm. And um, I remember watching that on my little TV on the edge of my bed and thinking to myself, what a great way to earn a living. And and then I become a garden designer and I happened to be lucky enough to be on TV. And when I met Alan Titchmarsh in 2016 at Chelsea, I told him that story. And he was bowled over by it. I said to him, Alan, you're the reason I got into this. So, wow. Do you pinch yourself every day, Danny? I do. I do pinch myself. I wake up and um, I pinch myself on so many different levels. Not the fact that I'm in TV, but mm. I pinch myself in, because I do something that I'm passionate about and, and love. It's a beautiful story, actually, and it, and it really, really shows that dreams you know without sounding like a cliche but this is this is the truth that dreams do come true especially when you are following the calling of your life what you are meant to be doing well i think that's the thing do something that you enjoy Mm. if you do something you love and enjoy it makes such a massive difference because it's easy to be good at that yes because you'll love doing it yeah you love doing it and you'll do it with love Mm. and it'll show Two people can make a sandwich mm. with exactly the same ingredients. Mm. One that tastes better than the other. They both made that cheese sandwich. They put both put the same amount of butter on. Mm. They both put the same amount of cheese in. They both put use the same bread, but mm. one will taste better than the other because one has done it with love and the other one hasn't. Oh, oh my goodness, I love that. This is <laughs> this is the magic ingredient of life, isn't it? It's a magic green of life. And it's a bit like when someone designs a garden. Mm. You can tell the one that's been built and designed by a person who really cares about what he's yeah. doing and the one who doesn't. They've got the same ingredients, 
They're using the same slabs, they're using the same plants, but one will look better than the other. Yeah, because everything everything that's done with love um, yeah. shines differently. It does, it mm. does. Mm. Beautiful. I am so, so happy that you have really given me the honour to be here today, Danny, and um, amazing. It It's beautiful always to talk to you and I learn so much that I'm going to put a lot of what you're saying in practice and I do think about it and when we spoke last time I remember I was thinking about your meeting with Joe and seeing things in a completely different perspective by just really changing in a way the window of how we look at things look at it with different eyes and um, everything then changes Thank you so much for coming today and, you know, sharing this beautiful wisdom. Now, I always ask my guests this at the end of the show. Tell us something that has helped you in your life, uh, Danny, that has inspired you. And really, especially in these times when people are maybe, you know, sadly losing hope, something that has given you hope and that, keeps you going through life what, what's given me hope and keeps me going through life mm. um oh that's a good question actually <laughs> <laughs> i know i know um, we do it sometimes and we don't even and you know we don't even realize that we're doing it but something that sort of i don't know gives you that um spark to keep going um I would say just um, getting up in the morning. I mean, to be fair, I know it might sound cliche, but if, if when I wake up in the morning, mm. if I'm breathing, if I'm breathing, um, you know, my heart's still pumping, I just think, thank goodness for that. Yeah. Everything else is a bonus. Yes. Mm. Absolutely. You know, And that's probably about it, really. And then, you know, and then just get on with your day and enjoy it. Yeah, to be alive, to really to be, be alive. alive. Yeah, to, to be alive. Yeah. yeah, that's that's to be alive is the only inspiration you need. Yes, and then everything just follows on from that, and the rest, and just yeah, and just just be just be happy and peaceful. Beautiful advice, and um, yes, another day to try again, I suppose. Exactly, and don't dwell on the past, and mm. don't dwell on negativity. Be positive. Yes, focus on the good things. Yeah. Mm. Focus on the things you're good at, not things you're bad at. Yes. That's very good advice, actually. Mm. Do what you can do. Um, and what you can't, exactly. you can't. You can't do it. Can't That's do it. it. And if you can't do it, someone else will be able to do it. Yes. Because we've all got our role to play and we've all yeah. got our special gift that's given only to us, I think. Absolutely. We've all got our strengths and we've all got our weaknesses. Mm. Concentrate on your strengths. And I think if you do that, you can't go far wrong. I'm in total agreement with you. Absolutely. Now, um, Danny, if and when some people, I'm sure, would like to contact you or to see more about what you do, give them a little pointer to where they can go to. Well, you can follow me on Twitter, mm-hmm. or Facebook, and and on Instagram. So I'm under the Black Gardener, so I'm very easy to find. And can they contact you also via email on your um, website? Yep. Again, the Black Gardener at gmail dot com. Okay, wonderful. I love that actually. I didn't realise that about the Black Farmer because I really like the products. So yeah. um, I've learned something actually today. But. <laughs> Thank, thank you. I wish you all the very best. And please do come again after you've done your show and everything with your wonderful inspirational, you know, talk. It it really brings a joy because it's so simple and so natural. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. And yeah, um, thanks, Mimi. Take care. And you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Danny Clark. What an inspiring story and what a beautiful reminder about how you can absolutely find the most amazing things within yourself when you touch upon nature. 
Thank you so much for joining me today. And I'm sending you lots of love. Until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to Secrets for an Inspirational Life, brought to you by your host, Mimi Novik. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and see you in the next episode. For more information about Mimi Novik and her books, music and inspirational work, take a look at her website, www.miminovic.co.uk.